Let's do some examples of Bayes' formula. Uh, in the first one, you have two jars sitting in front of you. Probability involves a lot of jars and urns and jugs that are typically full of things, if you haven't noticed yet. The first jar has two white balls and seven black balls in it. And the second jar has five white balls and six black balls. And so you're going to reach into one of these two jars and uh, you're going to pull out one of these uh, balls, which might be white or black. Uh, you're going to flip a coin and you're going to draw a ball uh, from the first urn slash jar. Uh, it's a mistake on the slides. They're the same thing. If you get heads, so heads means you pull a ball out of the first jar. And tails means you pull a ball out of the second jar. Okay, so let's suppose a white ball was selected and you want to know what is the probability that the coin toss was heads. So the way to think about this is that I would, I would step off the camera like that. And I'm standing over here and I'm telling you I am flipping a coin and uh, I am um, uh, pulling a, a ball out of an urn and now I'm coming back and in this case I am holding a, a white ball. I don't have a white ball handy so you can just imagine that. Okay, so all you know is that at the end of this random process that involved flipping coins and reaching into urns, I'm now holding a white ball. And now you want to use Bayes' formula to recover the probability to say, well, how likely is it that that coin toss was heads. Let's use Bayes' theorem to work this out. The best way to approach these problems, in my view, is to begin by just writing down all of the events that could be of interest to you. In this case, we'll say that H and T are the events that you roll, uh, sorry, that you uh, flip heads or tails. So H will be the event that you have heads. T will be the event that you have tails. And then, the other events that are of interest to us are whether you have uh, a ball or a white or a black ball. So we'll say W will be the event that you have a white ball. And uh, B will be the event that you uh, pull out a black ball. Alrighty. So uh, what do we know, first of all? Some easy probabilities that we work out are, sorry, before I do that, let's write in terms of conditional probabilities what the probability or what the event is that we're interested in because that is going to guide us in terms of how we uh, apply Bayes' formula. So what we want to determine is what I've written there on the slide, which is we want the probability of um, heads, the probability that we initially flipped heads, given that the ball that I am holding is white. So we want the probability of H given W uh, with respect to this notation. The best way to approach these problems, as I was starting to say a minute ago, is that you want to write down all of the probabilities that you know, that you can just sort of infer from what's written on the table. And I recommend just writing them out in a scattered, haphazard way, just anything that you can tease out from that description there. So what are some obvious things that we know? Certainly, we know that the probability of getting heads, of course, that's equal to the probability of getting tails which is just one half, nothing interesting there. And let's look at some conditional probabilities that we can evaluate here. Because remember, we want the probability of H given W. And if we're going to apply Bayes' formula, if you remember, we're going to express this in terms of the probability of W given H. And so how is that going to work? Well, what is probability of W given H? What does that mean in words? The probability of W given H means what's the probability that I'm holding a white ball given that I flipped heads, that the coin flip was heads. So how can we work that out? If I flip heads, as the problem tells you, it means I'm pulling a ball out of the first urn. So what does that mean? The first urn, the first jar, has two white and seven black balls. And so therefore, the probability of W given heads is going to be equal to uh, two out of seven or sorry, two out of nine. And if I flipped heads, the probability of getting a white marble or a white ball would be the probability of W given tails. That means I'm pulling a ball out of that second urn. And the second urn has five white uh, balls and uh, six black balls, which means the probability of a white ball, given that I saw tails, is five on 11. Alrighty, so now, uh, in fact, I'm going to claim that we can apply a base formula from this because what base formula tells you, if we use the partition as being a heads and tails, 
is you'd see that the probability of h given w, which is what we want, the probability that I flipped heads given that a white marble is what I'm holding at the end of the day, is going to be the probability of w given h, which we know, times the probability of h. And again, I'm doing nothing more than plugging in that formula, substituting w and, uh, sorry, substituting h and t for a1 through a n. And uh, then the event b is, is what I'm calling uh, h here. Or rather, I'm giving a w, sorry. So you can refer back to that formula if you'd like. And so that's the numerator. And then the denominator is just the sum of these conditional probabilities, if you plug those in. So on the bottom, it's probability of w given h times the probability of h plus the probability of w given t times the probability of t. And now if you look back, actually all of these expressions here are ones that I've written down somewhere. So it's just a matter of plugging in these numbers and you work that out and you get 22 on 67. So that's the probability that the first coin toss was heads, given that at the end of this whole uh, process, I'm holding a white ball. The next example is a fictitious, fictitious one that comes from epidemiology, and um, it works like this. I think you'll see soon that the assumptions are pretty unrealistic, but uh, conceptually it does serve a, a pretty useful purpose. So you've got a country and you've got 200 million people in that country, and 40,000 of them have a virus. Now, how would we know that number? Uh, we know how hard it is to actually estimate these numbers now, so you're gonna have to bear with me and just accept that somehow we know this piece of information. Uh, and you have a test, okay? You've devised a test to detect whether people have this virus or not, and the accuracy is shown in this table here. So it says, if you have the virus, then 99% of the time, you're gonna get a positive result. Uh, if you don't have the virus, then you're going to get a negative result 98% of the time. And so this 1% and 2% here is just what's left over in those other events, right? If you, if you do have the virus, you will get a negative result 1% of the time. It would be common sense here to look at this table and say that the test is somewhere between 98 and 99% effective, given the numbers that you see here. Uh, we'll pick that apart a little more carefully. Let's just ask a bigger question. Is this a good test? What is the right way to measure this? How do I actually measure how good a test is or not? What do I really want to look at? Well, the way this table is phrased is not really what's of interest to you when you're doing a test for a sickness. The table says if you know the virus is present, then you have a high likelihood of a positive test and vice versa if the virus is not there. That's not the context where you actually apply a test though. I'm not applying a test on someone that I know already has the virus. That doesn't make any sense. The real question I want to ask is if the test is positive, how likely is it that I'm sick? So what is the probability of having the virus given a positive test? And this table expresses things in the opposite form. This table says if you have the virus, here's the probability of a positive test or a negative test and so on and so forth. So this sounds very Bayesian because we're taking you know, the A and B, the two events, and we're, reverse, we're reversing uh, what you're conditioning on. So this is a, you know, a very natural application of Bayes' theorem. Let's define some quantities. As I said before, the best thing to do is just write down every event that you can see uh, in a totally, you know, a casual way and uh, look at it long enough that somehow Bayes' theorem starts to, or Bayes' formula starts to sort of appear and you can see how you might use that. So the events we'll use, we'll say V is the event that, you that the virus is present in a person, that you have the virus. Uh, v complement is going to be the event that you don't have the virus. So V and V complement form a partition, right? Either you have the virus or you don't, and only one of those two op outcomes is, is possible. So we've got virus and no virus, that's V and V complement. And then you've got P and N, which uh, are the events that the test is positive or negative. So P means positive test, N means a negative test. And we're gonna try and, and take the contents of that table I showed you a moment ago and write out some probabilities and conditional probabilities and things like that. The table uh, that you just saw, it tells you information like this. So this says the probability of P, a positive test, given that you have the virus, V, is 0.99, right? You could recover that. This is from the upper left 
cell of that table. That's this one here. This is given that the virus is there, given V, here's the probability of a positive test P. So that's what that table tells us. And you can copy down those other entries down here, which I won't bore you with. I think you can understand that. So I've got four conditional probabilities written down here. And what else do I know? Uh, I, I said at the outset that the probability of having the virus is uh, 40,000, which is the 40,000 divided by 200 million. And that came from my initial statement that you somehow exogenously know that 40,000 40, people have this virus in a country of 200 million. As we all know by now, that's the hardest part of the problem, right? To actually get any sense of how many people have a virus. So the, the example is lousy for that reason, but I think there is still something useful that can tell us. So that information tells us the probability of having the virus is uh, 0 0.0002, 40,000 divided by 200 million. And so the probability of no virus, the probability of the complement is just one minus that, so 0.9998. Uh, so again, coupling all the stuff that we have here, we have enough information again to uh, apply uh, the base formula, and we'll do that now. Um, so let's suppose someone has a positive test. That's the event of interest. You have a positive test. What's the probability that they actually have that virus? So what does Bayes' formula tell us? We want the probability of the virus given a positive test. And so again, you plug in that formula, skip back you know, a dozen slides or so. That's the probability of P given V times the probability of V, and then divided by this sum over here. So the partition in this case that you take, as I mentioned before, is virus or no virus. And uh, plug these numbers in and you get uh, 0.01. So uh, a natural topic of discussion here would be to ask, is this a good test? Uh, you could pause the video and think about that. It's not a very good test as I've written it there. It's not a very good test because it means if you get a positive test, there's still only a 1% chance that you actually have the virus. So the false alarm rate or the false positive rate, uh, as statisticians would call it, is really high, right? Just because you got a positive test, uh, you're still very unlikely to actually have this virus. The reason is that uh, there are more people, if you have a 1% uh, uh, false positive rate, as I had in that table before, that means that in a country of 200 million people, you're going to expect to see 2 million erroneous positive results, whereas there's only 40,000 people that actually have this virus at all. So the false positives uh, dwarf by almost an order of magnitude, or well over an order of magnitude, in fact, the... Uh, the, the number of people who actually have this virus. So the false positive rate is very high. So in that sense, it is not a good test. You can salvage it a little bit. It does have a redeeming quality, which is that a negative test is still a good indicator that you're healthy. If you get a negative test, you can pretty much rest assured that you don't have that virus. Uh, and how do you work that out? You'd use uh, Bayes' formula again, but now instead of looking at the probability of yes virus given a positive test, we'd look at the probability of no virus given a negative test. You work out those numbers and you get something that's slightly larger than 99%. So negative tests you can rely on, you can trust that, but uh, positive tests are not actually very useful to you. So is it sensible to say that this test has a 99% success rate? Probably not if you're looking at what people are actually interested in when they take these tests. The third example is pretty contrived. Uh, you have four coins that have a really strange weight to them, so that if you flip the ith coin, then you see heads with probability i on four. Uh, so you have four coins, which means the, the last coin, the fourth coin, um, is always heads. So it's, it's just double-sided or something like that, or it has some weird weighting where it only ever comes up heads. Whereas the first coin has only a one in four chance of showing heads. So these four bizarre coins, and you select one of these coins at random, uh, let's say uniformly at random, so you, you close your eyes, reach into a jar, pull out a coin and flip it, and you see hits. And so we're going to ask the question, what is the probability that out of all those coins that we uh, selected, what's the probability it was the third one? Uh, intuitively, it's pretty likely that you had the third or the fourth coin because uh, it's unlikely at this point that you would have seen the uh, first coin because if you had the first coin, there's only a one in four chance of seeing heads. So given that you're looking at heads, you're probably more likely to, to um, you're probably more in favor of the seeing the, the third or fourth coin. So let's work these numbers out. What we're going to do here is this time we're going to have our partition consist of four pieces. 
uh, A1 through A4, which is the event that uh, one of these coins is selected. So A sub I will be the event that the ith coin is the one that we choose. And we assume initially that these are all equally likely to, to pull out of the, uh, out of the um, jar or the hat or wherever they are. And so the probability of each of these events is one fourth. That's the probability of, of each coin being selected. H will be the event that you see heads. And what we are interested in is the probability of A sub I given H. What is the probability that I picked the third coin, sorry, the probability of A3, not AI, probability of A3 given H, uh, the probability that I picked the third coin given that I see heads. Uh, again, you can apply a Bayes rule here. Let's try writing out all of the quantities that, that we can think of. Um, the probability of heads given A1 is one fourth. The probability of heads given A2 is one half. The probability of heads given A3 is three fourths. And the probability of heads given A4 is one, right? This is just me writing down how likely each of these four coins is to get heads uh, in a conditional manner. So you do that. You plug in all these values here, you find that the probability of A sub I, A3 given H, is H given A3 times probability of A3 divided by this nasty sum of four things over there. Uh, plug in all the numbers that we computed up above, and we see that the final number is three on 10. So there's a three in 10 probability that you selected the third coin. Let's next talk about random variables. When you make a probability model of some phenomenon, you generate a sample space. And if you remember from the earlier lecture, that describes all the possible outcomes of an experiment. Uh, that's rolling a die, a single die, you'd have the outcomes would be the numbers one through six. Rolling the two dice and summing the uh, result would be the numbers two through 12 and so on and so forth. With each of those outcomes, you associate a probability. Right? You'd say, well, the probability of rolling a seven with two dice is a, a six out of 36 or one sixth and so on and so forth. Simple cases, rolling dice, playing cards, flipping a coin. We've seen all these before. To model more complex phenomena, uh, that's where we introduce this notion of a random variable, which you've probably seen before. A random variable is a function that takes each element in the sample space and maps it to the real line. Uh, in other words, it takes a real number and assigns that real number to each element in the sample space. Uh, if you're flipping a coin, for example, uh, you've got a sample space with, with two possibilities in it, right? Heads or tails. Uh, the most natural thing that people do in that situation is you would assign, a, you know, one number to heads and one number to tails. Uh, typically what you do is say that X is equal to zero. A value of zero represents, say, heads and one if the coin lands tails. So you'd say, okay, instead of talking about heads and tails, we'll talk about zeros and ones. Um, so the probability that X is equal to zero is the probability of seeing heads, which is one half, and uh, also for, uh, for tails, nothing interesting there. And X is then a random variable. Uh, rolling a pair of dice, you roll two dice and you record the sum of those two values, which is between two and 12. Uh, in this case, it's more obvious what the mapping should be because the outcomes are just numbers. So you'd say, well, you know, rolling dice, you get the number three. Well, then the, the value of the random variable is three. So there's a very obvious mapping between the uh, sample space and what the real numbers are. So in this case, the probability that X is equal to two, for example, would be one in 36 because that's rolling, you know, ones on both of those dice, which is a probability of one on 36. So not so interesting there. Usually, the mapping from the sample space to the real numbers is obvious. Right? Usually, it's not a difficult task to figure out how you should take the different outcomes and map them to numbers. It's, or if it's not obvious, it's arbitrary and it's up to you to choose that. Um, a random variable can be discrete, meaning that the sample space is finite or at least it's countable. So you could, you could write down uh, all of the uh, events that happen, um, meaning that you know, the, the uh, values are, are not, uh, they're all integer numbers. Uh, or it's continuous, uh, which means there's infinitely many uh, values that you could take in an uncountable fashion. So the two examples we just talked about, flipping a coin and rolling dice, those are both discrete uh, because we could write down all the possible outcomes. Uh, a continuous random variable could be something like temperature because the temperature in, uh, in a room or whatever could be 
you know, anywhere between 70 and 80 degrees Fahrenheit, right? So there's no, you can't count all the temperatures that you could get. It's a, it's a continuum. Or the time it takes you to drive somewhere, right? The time it takes me to get between one place to another is a continuous thing. It could be, um, it could be uh, uh, any, any number between, you know, some certain range. Um, what you typically do notationally is use an uppercase letter uh, to write a random variable and a lowercase letter would be a non-random variable. Usually when you see uppercase letters in a probability book, that refers to a random variable. When you're working with discrete random variables, uh, what you would typically uh, use to describe those discrete random variables is what's called a probability mass function. And I've drawn two of them here. For a discrete random variable, you can enumerate all of the elements of the sample space, like for the die, it's one through six, and so on and so forth. Map them to the real line, and then you make a stem plot that shows the probabilities associated with those events. That's what we've drawn here. This thing here uh, does not, uh, this, there's no natural phenomenon this, this particular plot corresponds to. It's got negative values and positive values. So that's just a visual. If I'm rolling two dice and reporting the sum of those two, then the PMF looks like this. The PMF is, is the short for uh, abbreviation for probability mass function. Uh, you have the numbers two through 12 on the x-axis and above each of those, I have a little stem plot or a little bar that indicates uh, how likely that event is to happen. So that's a PMF, which stands for probability mass function. Uh, the probability mass function of a random variable is a set of probabilities P sub i assigned to each of those values taken on by the discrete random variable. So the P sub, uh, so P sub two here would be one on 36, P sub three would be one on 18 and so on and so forth. And then X two, uh, sorry, X two would be two, X three would be three, X four would be four and so on and so forth. So the X's represent the value of the random variable and the P's represent the probability of seeing that random variable. So you say the probability of the random variable capital X being taking on some value X sub I is equal to P sub I. That's how that notation usually works. It'll become a lot clearer when you work with this for a few examples. This kind of stuff is hard to deal with when you're just looking at abstract uh, letters that don't have any numbers attached to them. So it's going to be more intuitive when you actually work through problems. So naturally, what do these have to satisfy? Of course, all of these PIs have to be between zero and one because they're probabilities. And all of these PIs, when you sum them together, they have to sum to one because probabilities, uh, the whole sample space has to sum to one. You often would write this by saying f of xi is equal to pi, which is by definition the probability that the random variable is equal to x sub i. Again, if you can understand that stem plot with the dice with the numbers 2 through 12, if that picture makes sense to you, you are completely fine. If you're tuning out when you see these f's and x's i's and things like that, don't worry about that. As long as you have that stem plot in your head, that's all you need to understand at this point. The cumulative distribution function, which we call CDF for short, is defined, uh, we call that a capital letter F, and F of X there is the probability that the random variable is less than or equal to this value X. So the PDF, or the, sorry, the PMF that we had before, we said little f of XI is the probability that the random variable is equal to that value. The CDF, the cumulative distribution function, is the probability that the random variable is less than or equal to that value. To make things concrete, imagine you're rolling two dice. This is the difference between me asking the probability of rolling a seven, for example, which we said was one and six, versus the probability of rolling something that's less than or equal to seven. The probability of that is uh, 21 on 36. Uh, so clearly all CDFs have to be monotonically non-decreasing. It just means they're getting bigger as you move to the right. Why is that? Because if x, if a little x gets bigger, then the probability of the random variable being less than x gets higher, right? What's the probability that the temperature outside is less than 70 degrees? Uh, what's the probability that the temperature outside is less than 80 degrees? What's the probability it's less than 90 degrees, 100, and so on and so forth? As those temperatures get bigger, that probability is getting closer and closer to 1. Uh, and in particular, it's always uh, getting bigger as well. Uh, if you roll two dice, the CDF looks like this thing here. So initially, um, of course, the CDF is 0, 
when you're less than two because it's not possible to roll two dice and see a number that's less than two. And then it, it consists of these sort of line segments that are flat and then they jump up, right? What is going on here? Well, so the CDF doesn't change as you go between, for example, five and six. Why doesn't it change? Well, the probability that I roll uh, you know, less than or equal to five and a half is the same as the probability that I roll less than or equal to five and three quarters because these dice only take on integer values. So there's nothing that changes between uh, these integer quantities because the dice are not capable of taking on any different values. So this is what's called a step function. It's just a bunch of uh, line segments uh, stacked one next to each other like that in this increasing way. And indeed, you can see that the probability there, the, the function is zero at the left, and then that function is one uh, over here as you move to the right, as you'd expect it to be. So this chart here, this function, this is the probability that the dice are less than or equal to the values shown on the x-axis. That's what's going on here. So say you're flipping a fair coin. Let's build our own uh, PMF and, uh, and CDF here. So you say you're flipping a fair coin. You pull a coin out of your pocket and you count how many times you flip until you see heads for the first time. This was that uh, St. Petersburg paradox problem that we looked at before. Uh, so that's the idea. You flip out a coin and you want to know the random variable, which is how many times do you flip this coin until heads shows up. Random variable X is going to describe the number of flips that it takes before you see heads for the first time. Let's compute the PMF and the CDF. So what's the probability that X is equal to one? That's the probability that you flip the coin on the first attempt and you see heads. That of course is one half because you're flipping a fair coin. So the probability that X is equal to one is one half. The probability that X is equal to two is the probability that the first heads that you see is on the second flip. How could that happen? That happens if you flip tails on the first attempt and heads on the second. The probability of that happening is one fourth because you have a one half probability of flipping tails and then a one half probability of flipping heads after that. Equivalently, the probability that X is equal to three is the probability that it takes you three flips until you see your first heads. That's the probability of seeing tails, tails, heads, which is one eighth and so on and so forth. So I think we see the pattern here. And the PMF at this case is that f of x, which is the probability that the random variable takes on a particular value x, is just two to the minus x. You could easily plug this into these values and, and verify that that works for, for integer values of x that are greater than or equal to one. The CDF for that, if you uh, go back to when you learned your uh, sums of infinite series, which has probably been a while ago, uh, is f of x is by definition the sum of all of these values of the PMF uh, from i equals 1 to x. So that's just the sum of 2 to the minus i from i equals 1 to the x. And honestly, you'd pull up Wolfram Alpha, uh, you'd use whatever tools are at your disposal, Maple if you like, and you'd find that the CDF is equal to this thing here, 1 minus 2 to the minus x. So now we've worked out the PMF and the CDF uh, for this. If you don't have an, if you aren't able to work out that summation in your head, don't worry about it. No one does. You're, you're allowed to use technology and, uh, and whatever you like for that. So you don't need to memorize sums of infinite series. That's, that's not going to be a part of this course. It's a probability course, not a summing of series courses, uh, course, excuse me. Um, let's next talk about some of the more common discrete random variables. There's some random variables that we use so often that they come up in so many different situations that we decide to give them special names. And uh, they come up often, they're very useful, they often have nice algebraic closed form expressions for their P, uh, PMF and their CDF, and so we'll go through some of those now. Uh, discrete probability distributions of interest include the Bernoulli distribution, the binomial distribution, the geometric distribution, and the Poisson distribution. The Bernoulli distribution is the world's simplest discrete random variable. It's basically used to model flipping a coin that may or may not be fair. A Bernoulli random variable can take on only two values, zero or one, and we would write f of one, which is the probability that x is equal to one, we'd say that's p, and therefore the probability that the random variable is equal to zero, the other value, is just one minus p, and therefore uh, uh, the CDF, if you just look at these things together, f of zero is equal to one minus p, and f of one is equal to one. Uh, we usually call x equals one a success, and x equals zero a failure, that's just a convention. You think of this as a weighted coin 
that you were flipping, right? So Bernoulli distribution just means, or Bernoulli random variable just means there's two possible outcomes, uh, yes or no, success or failure, uh, night or day, or whatever you like. Um, here is the PMF for uh, a, a Bernoulli distribution. Uh, here, the probability of zero uh, is, is higher than the probability of success, which is just the way I decided to draw that. So it couldn't possibly be simpler. Uh, now let's create something called a binomial distribution. Let's ask the following question. What happens if you take lots of independent Bernoulli trials with the same P each time and uh, we add them together? Okay, so what would this mean? This would mean like you're flipping a coin not once, but you're flipping it, you know, a hundred times and you're looking at the number of successes, say the number of times you see heads. And we're going to look at that kind of random variable. So we have a bunch of Bernoulli random variables, independent Bernoulli random variables, x1 through xn, and we're going to say x is a random variable, which is going to be the sum of all of these things. Okay, so flipping a coin once gives me a 0 or a 1. Flipping a coin 500 times, that could give me anywhere from 0 through 500, uh, depending on how many times I see heads. And so we introduced, or people invented something called a binomial distribution, which is used to model that. The binomial distribution depends on two things. It depends on n, which is the number of times you flip that coin, and p, which is the probability of seeing heads. And you use this to shorthand, uh, you'd write the shorthand as follows here, b of n comma p. Uh, means a binomial distribution where you take n experiments or n attempts and the probability of success of any one of those is p. So x just counts the number of times we get a 1 out of all of these n trials. Let's compute the PMF uh, for the binomial distribution. So what is the probability that the number of successes is exactly equal to some value x? This is like me asking if I flip a coin 500 times, what's the probability that I see heads exactly 237 times. That's the question here. Um, so how many ways could this happen? Okay, how many ways, uh, what are all the possible outcomes you could, you could get here? So let's say, what's the probability that I have uh, the number one appears, or I have a success exactly x times? Well, maybe the way this happens is that your first x attempts are all a success, and then your remaining attempts are all failures. That's very unlikely, but we're just showing this out as an example. Um, what is the probability of this event happening? Well, you have x successes, so it would be p to the power of x, and then n minus x failures. That's this part over here. So that's 1 minus p to the n minus x. This is the probability of seeing this outcome happen, which is probably pretty small. Okay, that's the probability of that sequence happen, of all your wins happening at the beginning and all your losses happen at the end. But you could also have all your losses at the beginning and your wins at the end, or you could have all kinds of crazy arrangements, right? Um, so let's ask the question, how many arrangements are there, right? How many different ways could I get uh, uh, success, failure, success, failure, failure, success, whatever? There's all sorts of different permutations, actually combinations is the word I should use there, but there's a lot of different ways in which this could happen, and let's count them all. So it turns out, um, if you remember your uh, combinatorics, that the number of different arrangements you could get, the number of different orderings or different ways that you could have x successes out of n attempts, is uh, this expression here. We say it's with the uh, expression for that is n choose x, and we write that as c of n comma x. And numerically, that's n factorial on top divided by x factorial times the quantity n minus x factorial. And so therefore, this is enough for us to compute the PMF of a binomial random variable. Uh, the probability that the random variable takes on some value x is n choose x times p to the x times 1 minus p to the n minus x, which is just this big, ugly thing here. Um, you will also see uh, notationally some people, instead of writing c of n comma x to mean uh, the number of ways to uh, select x entries out of n, um, you know, out of n possible uh, attempts, you'd also see it written this way, uh, n, n on top of an x like that. You'll see this too. Um, I think I'm kind of inconsistent about which one of these I use, so, so be prepared to look at both of those. Uh, the CDF for a binomial distribution does not have a particularly nice closed form. Okay, it doesn't, there isn't something nice you can write. That summation that you would have to take of the PMF doesn't really reduce algebraically. So there's not much to say about the CDF. The binomial distribution looks like this. I've drawn three separate binomial distributions uh, with different parameters here. So if you have 40 attempts, 
uh, with the probability of success of 0.5, you would see the, uh, the chart shown here. If you were to take, for example, in the green one, 30 attempts, but a success probability of 0.9, you'd see this, this green one over there like that. That's just the bi binomial distribution. It's like a discrete bell curve. That's really the way to think about it. Uh, a geometric distribution. Now, the binomial distribution counts how many successes you have out of n experiments from a Bernoulli random variable. The geometric distribution is something easier. The geometric distribution is the thing we looked at before about flipping a coin and counting the number of times until you see heads for the first time. The geometric distribution asks for the number of attempts for an experiment until you see your first success. We looked at this uh, example before in the context of a coin where you were flipping it and it was a fair coin with a probability of one half of heads or tails. A geometric distribution could have any kind of parameter there instead of one half. You could have, you know, a probability of success of one third or whatever the number is you like. So you'd say, what is the probability that it takes me exactly X attempts until my first success? So what would have to happen? It means your first x minus 1 attempts would have to be failures. So you'd have a 1 minus p to the power of x minus 1. And then your last attempt would have to be a success. So you'd multiply by p in there like that. Okay, so that's the uh, PMF for the geometric distribution. It looks like this thing right here. Uh, and the CDF, if you remember your sums of infinite series, uh, which is great if you do, it's uh, just this thing here, 1 minus uh, the quantity 1 minus p to the x. So geometric distribution is a pretty nice algebraic thing. Uh, and the geometric distribution looks like this thing here. It has this sort of exponential decay uh, that occurs depending on uh, how big the parameter is. So if p is equal to 0 0.9, that means you have a 90% probability of success, and then certainly you have a, a very high likelihood of your um, first success happening at your first attempt, and then things decrease very quickly because it's very unlikely that your first success is going to be way off in the future, uh, right? That, that would be pretty unlikely because uh, P is quite high. Uh, if P is 0.5 on the other hand, or actually, well, P is 0.5 is this orange one here, P is 0.2, has a much softer decay because you have a low likelihood of success, and so you know that probability is a little more spread out over those uh, over those entries that are far away. So geometric distribution is a exponential kind of decay that's happening there. The Poisson distribution is something you're going to learn a lot about. Uh, the Poisson distribution was something that you used when you have a finite number of trials, a finite number of attempts to succeed, and uh, a finite probability of success in each trial. So let's write down the binomial distribution again, where the probability of seeing the value x is equal to this thing here. Okay, again, this measures the number of successes out of n Bernoulli trials, each with a probability p of success. But now let's do the following. Let's take n times p and hold that constant, and let's n go to infinity. What does this represent? This means the following. This means I'm now, instead of going, instead of fixing, uh, so, n represents the number of experiments that you take, p represents the probability of success. Now what we're going to do is we're going to let n get really big, we're going to make lots of experiments, but we're also going to make p get small at the exact same rate. So instead of, say, 8 attempts and a probability of success of 50%, we would take 16 attempts uh, and a success probability of uh, 25%. So we, we, you know, you, you double the number of attempts and you divide the success probability in half. The way to think about this is the following. Um, if I sit around and stare at my phone, right, or I'll put it this way. If, I, if in any given second throughout the day, in any given instant, it is very unlikely that someone is going to call me on my phone. But if I sit around and I stare at my phone for four hours in a row, it's likely that someone is going to call me during that time interval there. And so what we're looking at is a very rare event, but we're taking lots of uh, attempts of this, or lots of uh, trials to, for success. And the precise manner in which we're doing that is we're saying n goes to infinity, and we're saying that n times p is equal to some parameter lambda. Or in other words, you could, you could, have, you could move that uh, n to the other side of this expression here if you wanted to, but don't worry about that. It doesn't really matter. Um, so you're taking many, many trials, and each of those has a very small probability of success. Um, physically, this resembles a lot of different systems. I've mentioned my phone call a minute ago. Uh, arrivals in a store, 
right? In any given second, it's unlikely someone's going to walk into my store. But of course, throughout the day, people do indeed enter my store, uh, waiting for a phone call, a machine breaking down. Again, all these, these sort of things where an event is unlikely to happen in any given instant, but you're assuming some extremely um, long range or a lot of attempts that you're making. So let's do this. We'll take lambda is equal to n times p, and we'll write p equal to lambda on n, and we have the PDF written here, or sorry, the PMF is written here. And you can show, I'm not going to do the calculus here, I'm not going to work out the limit, but it's a simple, straightforward limiting argument that as n approaches infinity in this thing here, in this expression, that PMF converges to this quantity there. Okay, f of x is equal to uh, lambda to the x on x factorial times e to the minus x. This is called the Poisson distribution. It's a PMF for all non-negative x. The Poisson distribution looks like this. You'll notice that for the orange values there, that corresponds to a small lambda. You have this exponential decay happening, uh, whereas for the uh, blue and green values here, in particular the blue, you actually have kind of a bell curve going on. So this can take on a variety of shapes depending on that parameter. In particular, when lambda is less than 1, you see this exponential decay, and when lambda is greater than 1, you see this sort of bell shape. When lambda is equal to 1, like I did there, um, you kind of have a bell shape that's sort of truncated or chopped right there at the beginning. That's the Poisson distribution.